tonight? Do you have any comments before we? No, um, it's it's a rather uh, light agenda overall tonight. Uh, to the consent agenda for this month uh, has the normal approval of minutes, uh, list of bills, treasurer's report, the motion to destroy closed session recordings, approval of personnel items, <laughs> uh, 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 FOIA requests that have come in, uh, and then there is a uh, minor lease extension for special as stumbling special education buses uh, on the agenda. Okay, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Before you uh, receive that motion, I'm going to ask that the personnel report be separated from the uh, consent agenda. Okay, I need a motion to approve the consent agenda with the removal of the personnel items. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the removal of the personnel items. I'll second. I'll second that. Okay. Mr. Shainberg? Aye. Ms. Foss? Aye. Mr. Blount? Aye. Mr. Sartorius? Aye. Mr. Skorzynski? Aye. Mrs. Conquest? Aye. Motion carries. Now I need a, a motion to approve the personnel items as presented. I, I would like to make that motion to approve the personnel items as presented this evening. I see they're on the screen. That's fantastic. You know, we hire very good people in our district, outstanding teachers, outstanding employees, not just teachers, and, and they should be recognized. So I make that motion that we, we approve it. Second. Mr. Skorzynski? Aye. Mr. Satorius? Aye. Mr. Blount? Aye. Mr. Shainberg? Aye. Ms. Foss? Aye. Mrs. Conquest? Aye. Motion carries. All right, our first action item for you is the 2021 tentative tax levy. Mrs. Robinson, could you please come step up? Good evening. Um, I don't have much of an update since last month. Um, there's just been a slight change um, in the information that I presented. I was able to get even a better estimate from Grundy County. So where before I think I was um, projecting a eight and a half percent increase in value, it's actually more like a seven and a half percent increase, which makes our overall property value increase right around 7%. And that matches up with the three scenarios that were given um, both last month and this month. The middle scenario is a 7% increase, so that lines up um, correctly. Um, so this month we ask that um, the board approve that we will put a public notice and establish a hearing for next um, month, which would be our meeting on December 13th at 6 p.m. Mrs. Any? Robinson, yes. which, uh, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> which newspaper do we put the uh, public notice in? We put it in the Herald News and the, is it the Morris Herald? Is that what, yeah. Okay, we put the it Joliet in, Herald and the Morris yes, Herald? Yes, we put it in both just to cover. I, I don't believe we have to, but we, we just always put our publications okay. in both. So we're going to be above the high. We are going to. Just a little bit. Um. We are going to be, our, our overall tax rate is projected to decrease, but we, were, we will likely be in the middle, which was our typical right. scenario, right around um, 319, and our current tax rate is 325. So we will see, um, we are projecting to see a definite decrease in the tax rate. Um, to, to clarify, she's got three different scenarios, low, typical, and high. High would be an EAV increase of 10%, which sh she's now expecting around 7.5. Typical is presented. The middle column there is at 7, and so she's uh, projecting to come in just slightly over that. Any other questions for Mrs. Robinson? I have a, strange, a question, and I'm not sure if you would have the answer, but... Of the three counties that we serve, which ones uh, afford the most tax monies to us? Oh, well, definitely the overall, 50, yeah, 50% 50 of it is Grundy County, oh, okay. yes. I'll second. Any other questions for Mary? Okay, I need a motion to approve the 2021 tentative tax levy 
and approval of the public notice and establishment of the public hearing for December 13th at 6 p.m. I'll so move. I'll second it. Mr. Satorius? Aye. Mr. Blount? Aye. Mr. Shainberg? Aye. Mr. Skorzynski? Aye. Ms. Voss? Aye. Mrs. Conquest? Aye. Motion carries. Our next action item for you uh, is it going to be a, a, a slight change in practice from what we've done before. So I have it down here in action rather than in consent agenda. Um, the Board of Ed uh, has long subscribed to the uh, the press policy uh, revision service from the Illinois Association of School Boards. Uh, they send quarterly or, or three a year or something like that uh, issues that guide the board on required updates to policy based on changes in statute, uh, court rulings that have changed the way we need to interpret something or administrative rules that have come down. Um, and so um, throughout COVID, they were sending a few. And so we have two issues that we've brought forward for you to uh, adopt tonight. Uh, normally, we have gone through the process um, of not adopting them on the first night, but going through a first reading, second reading, and third reading. But in the history of, of my time here with the board, rarely are there policies that really require much discussion. There are a few, uh, but uh, most of the time it's required legal updates or they're just updating cross-references or something. So what we are proposing to do is, uh, and as allowed in, in your board policy, 2240 Board Policy Development, a policy on policy, um, is to uh, simply put these up for adoption on uh, the first reading, uh, as most of them are, uh, again, just minor edits or they've changed formatting or something like that. Uh, what we would propose is if any of the policies included in these updates, the board would like to discuss or uh, add edits or anything like that, we, we pull that out separately and we will remand that back to the policy committee, which is uh, Ms. Voss and Mr. Satorius. Uh, and then they will discuss the edits uh, and then bring back a recommendation to the board on whether they should uh, continue to adopt the edits or not. So, um, and, and at this time, we have not brought any of the updated administrative procedures. We will, we will present those to you once the policies are adopted so that we make sure the procedures are in line with uh, your final will on the policy. So, um, so tonight we have brought to you uh, the press issues uh, 106 from November of last year, and then uh, 107 from June of this year uh, for adoption, and we recommend adoption as presented with three exceptions. Uh, the first is policy 130, which is our uh, school district philosophy, our mission district, uh, uh, sorry, mission, vision, and values. Uh, we, are, uh, we are only asking you to change the text uh, given uh, in the paragraphs of the policy because our policy contains our mission statement and obviously the school boards would not have that. So um, the other two, uh, we are not asking you to adopt 6 colon 300 and 6 colon 310. Those are both high school graduation type requirements that have no bearing on, on what we do here in Manuka 201. I or staff could, would be happy to try to answer any questions you may have on any of these. Um, next month, we have already received uh, press issue 108. It was 316 pages. Uh, so we are in the process of going through that to find out uh, what needs immediate action, what we can take a little more time on. Uh, but I would expect us to bring some other batch of some policies uh, to you from there in the month of December. Any questions or statements regarding the policies presented tonight? I guess I should, well, one final thing. Um, I did send these policies to the policy committee two or three weeks ago, I think, to see if they had anything that they would like us to pull. They did not. So they were comfortable with me bringing these to you for, for action tonight. I do have a question on the process. You said this is different from our usual process with the three readings. With straightforward or legal policies, is this to be the way forward or are we doing it this way because of the, the backlog? No, I, I would propose that if, if these are just minor edits that really don't, uh, you know, uh, change the spirit of the uh, or like any overarching theme uh, of the policy, I would like to bring some of these uh, for adoption on first reading. There's a lot of districts that do that. Um, if we were going to get into changing like a, a big philosophy type thing or uh, like the, uh, the code of conduct that we just did with the teachers uh, and, the, and all of our staff here in the district, to me, that's a three reading because we made some, some edits in, uh, there. But... Yes. A lot of what comes to us from press is 
the statute changed. This is required by law. Thank you. Then I would make a motion to adopt the press policy revisions as presented. Second that motion. Mr. Schoenberg? Aye. Mr. Blount? Aye. Mr. Sartorius? Aye. Mr. Skorzynski? Aye. Ms. Foss? Aye. Mrs. Conquest? Aye. Motion carries. At this point, I would like to ask Mr. Suzik to come up to the lectern to discuss some of the things going on in his technology department. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a couple quick things on uh, the board packet and the next department planning section. Um, uh, we've, uh, as everyone knows, the global supply chain obviously impacts everyone everywhere and uh, devices for next school year are already kind of getting gobbled up. So we need to make plans for procuring these as I'm being told anywhere between, between four and seven months on various devices that we would need for the start of the next school year. Uh, that being said, uh, as part of like the little brief I have here, we'd be looking at Chromebooks for second and fifth grade to continue our one-to-one -one program. Uh, roughly 100 staff laptops for Minook Elementary School and Auxable staff. And then uh, staff and student iPads, uh, basically replacing older staff iPads that are already out there, used by many different services and uh, anticipated growth for K-1 iPads. Uh, that being said, uh, it, my hope would be to bring a collective uh, action item at the December board meeting for a starting what we traditionally do here is a four year lease uh, for all this equipment and estimated about 117,000 for an annual payment. The great news that just came in earlier today is Mary Robinson looks like she got the green light for approval for uh, roughly $247,000 to be uh, towards uh, device, student devices. So a large, so these numbers will come down significantly provided that, uh, you know, continues as is and uh, no hiccups there. So that'd be a big news to bring that cost way down. So I hope to be bringing to the actual item at the December board meeting would be staff laptops and iPads and possibly the remainder of a Chromebook order that doesn't get covered by a grant order. So we'll figure all those moving shells out, hopefully, and have something for you guys to vote on at the December or at the latest January board meeting. Uh, beyond that, though, uh, we're bringing the, uh, that's kind of getting ready for next year. And most of that is just replacing devices that are, you know, aging devices that not a lot of, not a lot of new things going on there, just replacing old things. So uh, we're getting the Ed Tech Committee back on, uh, back on board and that's being charged with looking at the classroom of the future. What is the Manuka 201 classroom of the future when you talk about the educational and technology kind of integration in the classroom and how it impacts teaching and learning? So we sent out a big uh, flyer or form the other day and we have a lot of teachers who have expressed interest. We have our first meeting already scheduled uh, for in the first week of December. And so what we're gonna be looking at is basically, so what functionality do we need to install or fix in the classroom to give our teachers you know, more flexibility, uh, more efficiency, uh, give our students easier access to things, uh, and just really improve just the entire scope of teaching and learning in the classroom. Uh, that being said, you know, this will, this could become almost like a Santa Claus list of, you know, wants. So part of the charge of the Ed Tech Committee is really kind of look at all these different technologies, whether it's hardware, software, services that make a difference, and then try to prioritize that in a, in a manner that we can uh, also uh, plan and budget for, for a kind of a, a testing and then eventual rollout to various schools or grade levels, depending on the technology or need as it comes up. Um, like one, one example that uh, already is kind of a hot topic is the ability for teachers to be able to wirelessly cast their screen to the whiteboard uh, without being hooked into the wall. And we've been experimenting with different means of doing that and, uh, and I assume the, the tech committee would be you know, very keenly interested in that. But I'm also in, interested to find out as we progress down this path to see what are, what are the things that I'm not aware of that teachers are, would be telling us that this is something we should be investigating, this is something we should be trying out that could make a big difference in the classroom. So 
again, uh, we're going to start off uh, in, in December and, and continue on down the road and, and start trying to come up with a the future of the classroom, uh, you know, and do kind of a gap analysis essentially of what we don't have, and then try to prioritize and plan working with budgetary constraints and and just resources uh, to see what we can make happen in the most efficient and effective way possible. Um, so uh, I look forward to uh, updating you guys on the progress of the committee as we uh, as we meet uh, probably every other month right now is the, the plan. And with that, I'll open up any questions you guys may have. Could you give just a quick um, explanation with so many new board members of kind of how we procure these Chromebooks um, just to kind of explain why we're purchasing, you know, what we're purchasing or looking to lease what we're looking to lease, I should say. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, with a uh, when you're looking at say a, a thousand Chromebooks, which is what we'd be looking at for second and fifth grade, you know that scales out. That's a pretty uh, hard pill to swallow on a budgetary hit on one year. So, what we have been doing historically is w we've been getting into a rotation and find out when these devices are ending their service, and if these devices are we're expecting them last four years. So, we've been uh, we have been going out to bid or proposal for a four year lease to own. Uh, uh, agreements, if you will. So uh, we purchase or procure like a last, like this summer, we did a four year lease for the fifth grade Chromebooks and second grade. And at the end of their lifespan, then we will own them. And then we can either sell them back to students and family community or put them back into circulation as spares or other just growth. And we need devices to hand off to anybody. Uh, that has helped the budgetary planning process where we get things on like um, a better cycle of uh, lifespan cycle instead of running all the way into the ground until it doesn't work and then hit you guys with a huge bill to replace everything all at once. So that has been well received historically uh, by the board and budgetary planning just to kind of keep things without huge spikes uh, every couple of years, more of a uh, even keel to the best of our ability. <laughs> Are you finding that that four year works well in that process for you? Uh, so far it, it has, um, we have uh, still some more work and it also kind of depends on uh, just what devices go where and how they're being used. But yeah, so far we've been happy with that. I mean, at the end of the fourth year, whether it's a staff laptop or a Chromebook, um, it, you know, you, you can now, you can see it. I don't know if we just jinxed ourselves or not with a four-year lease, but you can see it more than maybe we would have, you know, eight years ago when we ran things five years. But um, it it keeps, uh, you know, the tech department, well, it keeps the teachers using something, you know, highly functional uh, more often than not. And it keeps the tech department from just trying to Frankenstein solutions, which is what we get into when we let things go past a reasonable lifespan on, on a device. Hi, Aaron. Can you explain the um, the use case scenario, the difference from the Chromebooks to the iPads? So right now, uh, so we're we're one to one devices K through eight here. Uh, K one, it was uh, decided that it would be more applicable and appropriate for them to have iPads, and then second through eighth grade, uh, it was decided uh, those students should be issued Chromebooks. So based on that, we did a lot of kind of seashelling and kind of coming up with what grades would make the most sense to then use these Chromebooks and then get replaced at, at these grade levels. Um, so that's that's kind of how uh, that got laid out, I guess. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So all, all devices do go home with students or, or are allowed to go home, um, you know, K through eight. So uh, we try to put them in various different protective cases, bags, whatever, to prolong that, but there is breakage. <laughs> that was my other question. Are, are we gonna be looking at purchasing of cases and um, protective bags or whatever you're choosing to use? Yes, I, I, uh, I just kind of uh, assume right now, like on these, co in the, well, it's not on that screen, but on, the, on your thing, um, the, the cost there is including some type of like generic uh, case cost, just because I, I kind of view that as just the cost of doing business now. So I think I would, I would be very fearful of devices going home without any kind of case bag, whatever. Uh, that is most likely a recipe for disaster on just the repair front and services. Uh, so. Any other questions for Mr. Souza? 
All right, thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. Well, before you oh, go, I would just, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry, I waited, <laughs> until, I waited until the last minute. Um, with the perhaps adjustments of uh, enrollments that are fluctuating a little bit and the supply chain as they interact with each other, um, I would imagine that's changing the way in which you go about estimating your orders and w what you want to make sure you have in time. Are you confident that the, the current one year at a time plan is going to make sure we have everything we need year by year? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Uh, I mean, we've obviously dipped historically quite low from what we used to be pre-COVID district-wide, uh, student enrollment-wise. And so what we're, we tried to look at what, um, if all the, for example, um, fifth grade, uh, we can look at the numbers right now. How many fourth graders do we have? And then we add in maybe uh, an extra 20. I think historically, you know, Mrs. Pico will find she gets 20, 25 brand new fifth graders like over the summer. Uh, and then we add a little bit more for kind of a October, November move in. Um, they never really go to waste because when we order a little extra, um, they get used as spares loaners as things break and we have to repair. And then as kids move in, let's say they move in in sixth grade, we ideally give that student what the, like the fifth grade cohort device in, you know, if we're, if we still have them to answer your question, it is a guessing game. We do the best we can. Um, it is a little, um, it can be aggravating because, uh, like at the beginning of this school year, I was very concerned that we would run out of iPads and we arguably did, but we ran out in October. So we emergency ordered, if you will, 30 iPads in July, and we got them like in the last week of September. <laughs> you know, like, so we, uh, we do the best we can on that. And, um, but so no, so to answer your question on the iPads, nobody, it wasn't, we always had an iPad for a student. We never hit that. But once we got the new ones in, we, uh, we were fine and we never actually weren't able to give a student one, but we could have, if we had a couple large families roll in on us, <laughs> you know, in that last week of September, but we dodged that it is a guessing game. It is difficult, but, uh, the good news is as we add and pad a little bit, they get used somehow, some way they find a way <laughs> into a kid's hands. Um, so if that helps, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Mr. Souza. I believe we are gonna start administrative reports off with uh, Director of Human Resources, uh, Sarah Massey, since uh, she couldn't be here. She has two months worth of, of details and reports to give you. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is not two months worth, so I'm, I'm gonna keep it short and sweeter. I think they'd run me up and out of here. So um, we've been busy in the HR department here, and, and by HR department, I include Ms. Lori Shanholzer and Lisa, Lisa Kate Jurgens um, as my compadres in crime, if you will. Uh, one of the things that we do on a weekly basis, Lisa Kate helps me monitor the over 100 employees that we have that are unvaccinated. Uh, so we still have a regiment set up where folks have to turn in test results to us. Their testing window is from Friday to, mo or to Wednesday. So they have from Friday of the previous week until Wednesday of the current week to submit a negative, hopefully negative <laughs> test result to us. Uh, we do have those testing sites um, within our buildings and anybody from transportation or special circumstances can come here to district office to get tested. So we've made those arrangements and I think that's been received very well by our staff. Uh, but again, we have about 100 uh, that we monitor weekly. Uh, what we end up doing on Wednesdays when we have a batch of folks that still haven't turned in their, their results yet, uh, we send emails to the principals, send emails to the individuals, just reminding them of those deadlines. Uh, and then it's couple of weeks here, I've, I've contacted principals Thursday morning to let them know, hey, if you don't have response from this person, you know, they can't, they can't step foot in the classroom or perform their duty unless we have a, a COVID response or a COVID test result um, for this current week. So fingers crossed, we've been pretty fortunate. Uh, we've not had that issue. Um, but we are, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's becoming a chore, if you will, <laughs> for everybody involved. Um, but we are, uh, we're like a dog on a bone about that every week. So uh, thanks to the principals for uh, helping me, and uh, I know they get tired of receiving my emails and phone calls uh, about this, but uh, but together we're we're making it happen. So uh, that 100 fluctuates, by the way, between new employees that come in. Uh, we'll have folks that maybe test positive that then get um, you know a little leeway while they uh, you know are, are working through their symptoms and whatnot. So it's a pretty fluid 100, but we've stayed pretty solid there the whole time we've been doing this. 
uh, staffing vacancies. We still have some. <laughs> um, we've been, that also has been fluid. Um, it fluctuates just when we think we're really knocking it out of the park and getting everybody filled, we'll have somebody else pop up or the blessing of being able to add some program assistance uh, has created some additional vacancies for us here. Just to give you a basic rundown, currently uh, program assistance, we have six openings throughout the district. Uh, for permanent subs, we have one throughout the district, uh, teachers, we have two SPED teacher openings still, and Dr. Staub and I have been working on trying to, to beat the bushes and find some people who are qualified in special education uh, and uh, don't have jobs currently. So one thing Dr. Staub did was reach out to some of the agencies that we work with to see if they had any graduates uh, or folks that were unemployed permanently at this point. Don't believe you've had much success with that outreach. Um, we've reached out to universities. Uh, we're coming up on December here where we may be able to find some December grads, uh, but there, there are not, there's not a pool sitting out there. Um, so we're working real hard and I know the principals in, in those buildings that have those vacancies are getting really creative on uh, figuring out coverage for their students to make sure that they're, they're not missing out uh, because we can't find a certified teacher in the special education field to, to fill those positions, but we're still trying. Um, we have one campus monitor position open in the district, and <clears throat> we have officially one nurse position open uh, within our district as well, and we're working with Amy Pelnarsh on filling that. I know she made a recommendation uh, today, or was going to make a recommendation before the end of the day. I don't know if you got that or not, Lori, uh, but she made some reference calls, and those came back really positive, so we're hoping to be able to fill that position. And then we have some custodial positions as well. Um, subs, are, of course, are always needed in the custodial world. Um, and then we have an anticipated retirement in December that'll create a vacancy in our custodial world. So those are our, our current staffing uh, vacancies. Principals are doing a great job of filling those as, as quickly as they can. We in the HR office will do some of the behind the scenes work of making phone calls, setting up interviews, doing reference checks if they need us to, conducting the interviews if they need us to do that as well. So we, uh, we always kind of lay ourselves out there for the principals and tell us to, to use us as they see fit in that sense. Uh, only because the HR department doesn't normally post these, uh, at least not with the frequency with the aides, but we still need bus drivers. Oh, and goodness, bus, yes. Yeah, we still need transportation <laughs> employees galore. So Absolutely. For everyone watching at home, if you would like to be a teacher's aide, if you would like to be a cafeteria worker, if you would like to be a bus driver, if you would like to be an aide, we have positions for all makes and models. Come one, come all. That's right. <laughs> Uh, one of the other uh, big undertakings we had here in the HR office um, this past month, since the last board meeting, actually, there was a question about staff demographics that was posed. Um, so we sent out and conducted a staff demographic survey to get updated data to you, to you folks and for ourselves as well. We used that data for our state and federal reporting, um, and we needed to update that. Uh, so we w did that. We were also able, we took it a little step further, uh, and working with Aaron, Aaron has created a, a really nice program program that we refer to as our onboarding program. Um, and typically it was used for when we would hire someone, they would they'd get input into the system and then they would live and Lori would be able to pull up a report for us principals and tell us you know, who was where and, and how that looked. Um, but it, it kind of just sat there as a system. This year we started to use it a little more and Aaron's made it more robust. Um, when we collected COVID vaccination data from our staff, we input it into this system. When we collected the demographic data, Aaron just put input that into the system as well. Um, we also are working on the employee tracking, uh, assignment tracking, if you will. So when someone, for example, me, when I left the junior high and transferred to district office, Lori made that officially official in onboarding. So now we have a program that will show historically where folks are throughout our district as they, they have tenure with us. Um, and whether it's from position to position or building to building, just helps us keep a historical reference of our staff. So Aaron's been impl just knocking it out of the park with making that a more robust system. Um, and I can't thank him enough. I'll, I'll give him a call and be like, hey, I've got this idea and he just makes it happen. So. Uh, can't ha can't ask him uh, to do any more on that for a little while. I think I got to lay off of the onboarding, but um, Mary also will put that information in SDS, which is the system that she uses for all things state reporting. So the demographic information will be input into that uh, system as well. And again, that ultimately will allow us to uh, pull more accurate data about our staff 
when it comes to those state reports and anything else we need it to, to be collected for. Um, transportation incentives. So our transportation department is, as you know, we were worried at the beginning of the year, pretty depleted. Were we gonna be able to have enough buses to run, enough drivers? Um, we have been working in uh, collaboration with District 111, uh, and we are offering, sponsoring, I should say, um, breakfast or lunches once a month for those folks. So uh, 111 took the first month. We had this month, so November 8th, we uh, went over, Dr. Staub, uh, Mary, Dr. Vaughn, myself, uh, Lori helped out, Lisa, Kate, and we delivered donuts, Casey's breakfast pizzas, juice, coffee, just kind of put on a spread for those folks, thank them for everything that they do when they get our kiddos to school safe and home safe every day. Um, we were able to give them, uh, winter's coming up, we know it's here, actually. <laughs> uh, we gave them stocking caps, little beanies, little 201 beanies as a, a thank you uh, for everything that they do for us as well. So uh, each month we're gonna do a little something special for them. Uh, next month they're gonna have a Christmas extravaganza, <laughs> a luncheon or something. Uh, the high school uh, is, is going to help with that. And uh, we have some some things that we are going to raffle off for them as appreciation. So just little tokens along the way to, to kind of keep their morale up and let them know that we appreciate them and we need them to be able to have school function. So that's been going very well. And again, I couldn't have couldn't have pulled that off without Mary helping out, Tiffany, Lori, and, and Lisa Kate really uh, you know, coming together and organizing that that luncheon for us. So we're gonna get ready for January will be our month again, so. And then finally, um, one of the things that we're working towards here now that we're able to, to catch our breath a little bit and start, as Aaron said, looking towards next year, um, growing into this position, uh, you know, I didn't really know what I didn't know until I've gotten into it. So now we're seeing some systems that need a little little improvement. Not that there's been anything wrong, but it's nice to have um, you know, a person who's responsible for that now instead of kind of everybody having their hand in a pot. So um, Mary and Tiffany and Dr. Mon and I have been meeting a little bit to talk about how we can improve some of the systems that we have in place, which are, are good, but they can get better. Um, an example of that would be when a principal would send an email recommending hire for an employee. They might send it to Dr. Mon, or they might send it to me. Um, sometimes Lori gets them, but there was really no consistent uh, information share. So we sent out a, Aaron again, <laughs> create for me an HR email group, and we included all of the folks sh that should have information about hires and resignations and things of that nature. And now principals know they just send it directly to that HR group. Uh, so that nobody's left out of the loop and knowing, you know, where did, oh, that person just resigned. I didn't know about that. Well, they sent that one to you and not me. So we cleaned that up a little bit. Um, working on enhancing our personnel report itself, uh, looking around at some of the other districts uh, and just seeing that, you know, we could, we could sharpen ours up a little bit, include some additional information. Like I said, that onboarding system uh, permits us to kind of centralize all that information together and cleaning up our reporting would, would just really enhance that as well. So we're gonna work on improving that. And then, um, like I said, the onboarding itself has been a real work in progress as far as expanding its use and capabilities uh, to, to better enhance what we do through the Office of HR and then to help everybody else kind of see that info in one spot. So those are some of my long-term goals, if you will. Anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy. Uh, somebody might have questions, but before we, <laughs> we do that, I don't think I've had the chance in this setting to, and this report proves that there, there's a lot going on in your world and for, for you. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that you, you've really jumped in and taken it and, and it's clearly moving in the right direction and I appreciate it. Thank you, I appreciate that. It was a good gesture that you all made for the bus drivers, um, for the breakfast and the lunch. And how was it received by them? They, I, they liked the hats. <laughs> that was a hit. Um, they, I, from what we heard, I know Chris went over a little bit later in the morning. The drivers have different shifts, so we didn't really catch a ton of them when we were dropping off. But I know Chris was able to go over and kind of mingle a little bit more. I think they were really, they're appreciative, right? Like they just any kind of a nod of appreciation they they accept and you know uh, thank us so they that was some gushing was happening <laughs> um and i think chris was on the receiving end of that so yeah i i, I think we are seeing that our drivers are um are, are really happy with some of the incentives that we put into play um and i think morale's pretty pretty decent for our our folks 
That's good. Thank I, you. I got a hug. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it was received well by at least one. That's good. Mine kind of piggybacked off that. If there's ever an opportunity where the board could be um, in person to thank them, um, would you just let us know that in case anybody has that free time? I know oftentimes it's during the workday and may not work out, but um, certainly can't run school without those folks transporting our kids. So. Absolutely. I will share with you, um, I'll send to Dr. Mon the date of the December luncheon that they're having so that if anyone's available, you guys are more than welcome to, to come and join us. Any other questions for Ms. Massey? Thank just you a much. thought, I'm sorry, just question. I'm not sure and if this is even permitted, but I wonder, because um, obviously a lot of the parents are impacted by mm -hmm. the buses being late because of the driver shortage. And, and I get it every day and I forget my kid's bus uh, bus number at some times. But um, I, I just wonder, like, are parents able, if they wanted to, to donate like to a fund and maybe, I know right now it's once a month you guys are you know, sponsoring, but what if parents were able to donate and maybe it's once a week, right? To donate to the fund. Now, just something to think about. I, I, I don't know how that's permitted or and such, but I know I myself and you know, I have multiple kids and so, you know, would certainly would like to do that. I will have Ms. Massey and Mrs. Robinson uh, discuss how that could possibly operate <laughs> and uh, bring you a, either a summary or some type of recommendation. Yep. Thank you guys very much. That was Sarah's definition of short and sweet. So now, uh, Mrs. Robinson, did you have anything? There we go. Uh, Mr. Searle. Um, good evening. I'd like to provide everybody with a brief update uh, on the Buildings and Grounds Department. We are currently working with a performance servicing company, PSI, to update our HVAC systems at Manuka Elementary School. PSI has done work for our district in the past. They're a pre-qualified general contractor. Uh, this allows us to hire them directly. PSI will bid all items necessary to complete our project, including labor. Additionally, uh, since they act as both architect and engineer, uh, they work directly with the ROE on our behalf. Um, this project will be paid for in part by the CARES Act funds. We should have the exact costs and we'll be able to present these uh, at the January board meeting, hopefully for your approval. The uh, final item, um, the rebid for our snow plowing uh, closed on November 5th. And unfortunately we had uh, zero bidders. Um, just talked to the high school today. They're experiencing the same thing. Um, I'm in the process of working with several contractors right now to try to put together a uh, plan to cover our snow removal needs. Uh, we anticipate uh, the district doing a portion. Maybe we'll do one or two schools. And uh, hopefully we'll have this resolved by the end of this week. Um, that's going to work basically as a kind of a stopgap measure. We're gonna to try to use the same measurements that are at, you know, from the bid, apply them to each of those contractors, try to make it as fair as we possibly can. Um, any questions I can help answer? Uh, with, with no formal bids, you do have contractors available on an individual basis to do work? Well, we're working with about four right now. Um, none of them have committed, but uh, I think I could call any of the four if we had a snow and they would all help us. I think that's my uh, question. So, yeah, yeah I think you. we're we're not without, um, if it was a light snow, we might be able to handle it on our own. Uh, we're trying to provide or purchase some equipment right now that would help us in an event that uh, a contractor failed or, um, you know, we wanted to start taking over a little bit more. That equipment is still not here. It's like every other thing that's out in the market right now, trying to procure something is, you know, many times harder than it was a year ago. Um, but we're hoping that equipment arrives by end of November, and that would give us a, an ability to salt the entire district if we had to. Um, you know, not the optimal way. Most of these companies would use three or four salt trucks to do our, our entire district where we would have one, but we could do it. Um, I do feel like we have 
you know, some good folks right now, the costs are running a little high. Uh, all the individuals that we're speaking with, they're all concerned about, obviously, labor costs, fuel costs, and then replacement of equipment costs, because right now there is no parts. So it's kind of a uh, completely different ballpark than we were in a year ago. And, um, you know, we're just kind of trying to get our way through it. Um, but I do feel like we'll have something. Any other questions? We're, we're looking for a, a year contract, right? That's what we're looking for? That's correct. And those four contractors, they, they don't want to submit a formal bid? They do not. And most of them look at it as just being too big. In other words, it takes approximately anywhere from three, depending on how you look at it, to 11 pieces of equipment to do our school district. And most of those contractors don't want to put, you know, multiple millions of dollars of equipment in one spot, because obviously if it's not a good snow season for us, they're not going to have any revenue where if they could spread it out to other areas, they stand a chance of having a better income stream. So we're having that trouble coupled with the biggest thing of all, which is a, just a plain labor shortage. All of our local folks are all experiencing the same problem, uh, just, you know, an extreme labor shortage. And uh, it's pretty much consistent with all of them. So, you know, we're trying to not rush into it because we're trying to keep the costs under control. Um, most of the folks that we've been able to speak with to this point are union versus non-union, which, you know, there is some advantages to that, but there's some disadvantages. And one of them is cost. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to get our way through it. I don't have an answer as of yet. Anything else? All right, thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, guys. Dr. Cheserek, excuse me, Dr. Cheserek, if you would like to address the board. Good evening, everyone. I just want to give you a quick update. You had uh, the board report, but just uh, to let you know that in the past month, I've continued to meet with ELA and math groups of teachers. They've been coming over to meet, and I know it's difficult to get subs at this time, but they're very appreciative to be able to come and join together uh, and collaborate. They've been working and sharing resources that they're currently using uh, with the new curriculum. They've been looking at assessments and reviewing the standards. So they've been working very well together. I really appreciate their time and coming over and collaborating. Um, next month, I'll be meeting with science and social studies teachers from the sixth through eighth grades. And we'll be continuing to meet each quarter with each of the grade levels and each of the subject areas, ELA and math. Um, as far as professional development goes, I've heard from the teachers that they really would like to see the lessons being instructed in person. That would be very helpful to them. So I did set up some um, observations that uh, they, the ELA teachers have been doing over at Nettle Creek Grade School in Morris. They're in year five of implementing wit and wisdom and they were very gracious to allow our teachers to come over and visit. So last week, second and third grade teachers visited. Tomorrow's kindergarten, uh, Wednesday is first grade, and then we're still working on setting up fourth grade. Um, seems to be very helpful to actually see uh, a lesson and be able to talk to the teacher afterwards and get some uh, of their ideas since they've been doing it for five years now. Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay, um, so I also have a connection over at Homer District and they've been implementing Eureka Math. So I'm in the works of setting up some visits over to that school district so our teachers can see. Um, also with our instructional coaches, uh, we've been meeting twice a month. They will be here next month to present to the board. You'll have a chance to meet them and we'll pr be presenting the governing document and kind of our timeline going forward. Uh, they will be visiting um, Downers Grove District 58. They've had a program for nine years now, and so our coaches will be visiting them in December. And that's all I have right now. 
Any question? Uh, yeah, um, th I think that's a great idea to have that, that observation time. Um, how are you collecting the, the feedback? Is there a, a system that you have in place so after they observe or they come back and delivering feedback or how are they doing that? I, I don't have anything formal in place right now, but I'm working on that I just uh, through conversations right now and, and meeting with them and finding out uh, some of the uh, resources that they have received from their visits, but I will be doing a more formal uh, collection of some data that I'll share with you. Thank you. Anyone else? No other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd just like to formally thank both Dr. Cesarek as well as the board and Superintendent Darlington from Nettle Creek for letting our folks uh, come and visit along with their staff. And then the board and superintendent, uh, Dr. Kevin Russell out in Downers Grove 58 and his assistant superintendent uh, is a man named Justin Sizzle. So thank you very much to, to all of the, the, our colleagues across the suburbs that are allowing our staff to have this wonderful opportunity. Dr. Stott. I'm going to share a little bit of information. I'm not going to take too much of your time tonight, but I wanted to share information on the SOS program that has been running um, at Manuka Junior High School. And I was going to pull up data, and now I've got to tape my 12 component password into <laughs> our system. So here it is. The SOS program is something that we started back um, probably about five years ago at our junior high school. And it is the Signs of Suicide program. It's a universal school-based prevention program designed for both middle school and high school age students. And this is in accordance with um, a state requirement that we do need to bring suicide prevention and education to all of our students in seventh and eighth grade. And then of course, high school students as well. We focus on our seventh and eighth graders here. Um, the goals of the system are to decrease suicide and suicides attempt by increasing student knowledge and adaptive student um, adaptive attitudes about depression, as well encouraging um, personal mental health su support and seeking mental health support when a child is in need. Um, it's also there to reduce the stigma of mental illness and make sure that we're acknowledging the importance of seeking help and treatment. So we've been doing this for several years within our district. Um, this year, we definitely had one of our highest years of students reaching out after the program. So part of the program is education. And then the second part is a student survey where students can um, request support kind of um, anonymously. And then the staff members will follow up with them individually so they're not um, singled out or anything within the school environment. So we had 262 students from our junior high program. That was 23% of the students that participated reached out after the programs to um, receive additional support. And um, there's different priorities levels within there. Um, 151 were priority one students, and that's where you follow up the same day. Um, 100, I'm sorry, there was um, 65 priority, stu priority two students, which means that um, that's not the highest tier. It's um, just a, more of an informal follow-up that you wanna follow up within two days, and then 46 priority three that you need to follow up within a week. So the students um, are again flagged for follow-up and then the our team, our student services team at the junior high will continue to follow up with these students and continue to provide support. Um, this also goes in um, alignment with our student um, social emotional learning needs assessment that we're currently completing with our um, social workers, school psychologists, and our academic counselors. We plan to bring a report back to the board in January to share where does our student social emotional learning need to go from here so we can start to make some um, more uh, proactive decisions to support our students' mental health needs as we know that that is definitely a crisis in the entire United States and especially within this area here close to home. Um, we want to make sure, again, that we're just we're there as a support for our students and that we're helping them find resources that they need. Um, so that was something I just wanted to highlight. There's additional details in my board report. If you guys haven't already looked at it, you can find more information there. Um, but I'll, I'll open it up if you have questions about that or anything else that was in our board report. I do have a question. And um, I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. And I think it's extremely important. And my question, um, 
I hope is not <laughs> taken outside of that, that with uh, suicide prevention and mental health, minimizing is one of the um, really difficult things to get your hands around for the, the student and young person themselves, minimizing what's going on. So with the third tier and a possible week before intervention or contact, um, I think to be honest, I'm a little concerned to be honest with the, the, the factor of minimizing being so prevalent versus there being that many tiers perhaps and that long of a time. If somebody's reaching out, it almost to me doesn't matter as much what they're saying than the fact that they're reaching out. And I should have included this. Our staff did follow up with all students within two days of self-reporting. So the, the program categorizes the students that you need to follow up within a week, but our staff, um, because we, are, we have our two social workers, our two academic counselors, and our school psychologist, so while, um, while one team member or two team members are presenting to the students, the other ones are, complete, are um, evaluating the surveys and following up with the students, so we were able to follow up with all of the students within I got two you. days. Th thank you for that clarification. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I should have explained that earlier. Just a question. I don't know if you're able to answer it right now, and if not, that's perfectly okay. But as we see the impact of, you know, the pandemic, you know, on our students, you know, um, emotional well-being, mental well-being, um, and we hear different reports and things that are happening, as, especially in even younger ages, um, with suicide attempts and um, you know, just mental health challenges in general. Um, and we've been hearing about, you know, bullying, for example, when someone is uh, or has reached out for help or um, is undergoing treatment or has expressed or other people are aware that there are some mental health challenges. Um, to your knowledge, do we have any challenges like that in our district where we're getting any reports of any bullying or anything like that surrounding, um, you know, our students' mental health, uh, their well-being, their treatment, um, anything that they've expressed as far as uh, challenges that they're having? Well, in general, the, the mental health profession is, is at a crisis right now. There's not enough mental health providers. So that's not only within schools, but also in clinical. Um, I know I've been speaking with local mental health resources. Um, we collaborate with a lot of the resources to provide professional development to our staff, as well as if a parent has um, a request, I would like my child to see a mental health provider outside of the school, then we have resources to provide to them. So we do communicate with a lot of the resources and the clinics in the area. And I know that they are, um, they are really struggling trying to find time to see all the students. Um, when it comes to our district and the specifics, um, is there are there concerns that we are making sure that we're addressing yes we definitely there is that that's part of what our administrators do day to day as well as our social workers our school psychologists and our academic counselors are constantly working with students to ensure that we're providing them support um, our, a big focus of our social emotional learning um, our needs assessment is going to be assessing are we providing the students the adequate amount of support? Is there additional support that we need to look into? Do we need to look at um, a more supportive curriculum than what we're currently utilizing the second step program? Or is that supportive enough? So th all of that is what our team is looking at within the social emotional um, needs assessment that we we kick started that in September. And um, our staff should expect to see some surveys uh, coming out within the next month that we'll be asking to collect data on that and then we'll bring that data back to you guys with recommendations and with that being said i think i already know the answer but i'm going to throw it out there anyway um, do we have enough staff to be able to support our students at this time we are down a couple of social workers within our district right now. We have a couple that are out on leave, and we have not been able to restaff those. So our, I would definitely say that our social emotional um, support staff are feeling the feeling some additional burden there. 
um, because they're they're covering each other's caseloads. But um, the other thing that I will say is that our staff is great about working together and being able to support each other. And when we have a need in one building, we might have some other staff members that have some additional, not that anybody has free time, <laughs> but additional time where they can um, kind of come over and support as well. So we've seen a lot of that, especially with um, some of the crises we've had within the district the last few weeks. Um, we've seen a lot of support from our buildings, also from our, um, our cooperative partners um, through the Gurney County Special Education Cooperative. So we definitely work well together, um, but yes, there is, there's always need. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's truly a scary time. I, like last week, right, it was, uh, you know, for our, our area, right, a lot of uh, suicides have happened and, um, and trying to be proactive is good and I understand the staffing issues and I wonder maybe there's tools and resources that we can proactively provide parents that they can kind of do on their own to just continue for us parents to speak with our children, right? Because it's new for everyone. No one knows, you know, how to handle it. And so possibly we can better equip our parents on how to handle everything that's going on. Most definitely. And that, that is a part of the program for those students that were flagged um, as a parental follow-up if need be. Um, but that's something we could share with all parents as well. So that's something I'll bring to our team. Thank you. Um, I only have a few things tonight. Uh, and the first was going to be to you know, mention that yes, the community has gone through uh, a couple of weeks of some some tragic losses. Uh, I know John Anthony, uh, student at junior, at, uh, former student at our junior high school, graduate of MJHS and an MCHS student, was a victim of suicide. And then uh, our young Breck and the Brave uh, that we've all been supporting so much over the past year. Um, and I know those services were tonight. And I can promise you, our staff were there in force to support the family during this time. So um, our condolences and our, our wishes for peace to, to both of those families. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, Mr. Finkelstein, was there any update on the DEI work uh, tonight? I was going to say, we've got a, another meeting with uh, our consultants tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, I know in December, we will have more to, to share with the board on what's happening. Yeah, we, uh, we have a follow up scheduled for tomorrow afternoon with the, uh, the uh, Safe Schools program that we've been working with. Um, we've had a couple trainings uh, at the junior high specifically on the 6th we have our teacher institute day we had a couple different trainings uh, surrounding the DEI umbrella. Um, furthermore, our uh, committee that includes uh, some of our community members uh, has taken off uh, and had its second uh, in person meeting uh, this past week so that is our aid committee which is uh, allies for inclusion diversity and equity. Um, so that committee has uh, has been moving we had an opportunity to share some pretty relevant local junior high data and dig through that together as a group uh, this past week. So uh, just just getting the ground, ground, you know, kind of get hitting the ground running. Happy to take any questions because we've been busy doing a lot of work. I will say that I, I have collected all the demographic data on our students, our staff, and then Mr. Finkelstein has sent me the MJHS specific things that I will be sharing with the board this week. Any questions for Mr. Finkelstein? We look forward to that update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my final comment of the time to, of the night before we go into board comments is just uh, as the first leg of uh, the holiday season comes up, comes upon us, we uh, here on behalf of the board and our district, we wish the community a, a wonderful holiday season. Uh, Thanksgiving and parent teacher conferences. Don't forget PT conferences are coming up uh, in just a, a few weeks um, or very soon, I'm sorry about that, uh, next week. And um, anyways, uh, there will be multiple opportunities to help families in need that our, uh, that our schools will be running. Uh, we will share them on social media uh, and, and get opportunities uh, out to the community so they know uh, how, what we're doing to support our fellow community members that uh, may need a helping hand. So please look for that and uh, look out for your neighbors, everyone. Have a, have a great holiday season. We'll see you again in December. Um, before I open up for any board comments, I want to make um, just a note to the board and anybody watching that our board meeting next month is December 13th. I know it's mentioned a couple times, but that is a week earlier than it typically falls in the month due to the holiday break. Um, so I wanted to make you guys aware of that. I would I would just follow up. Uh, and the 
our boardroom upstairs is now substantially completed. There's little tweaks we're going to continue to do, but it's very likely December we'll be back up in our regular boardroom. Any board topics tonight? I just wanted to thank Ms. Martinez. She has invited me into a couple classes to um, see our ELL um, co-teaching model. Um, that's been very uh, exciting to see. I was in the junior high last week and I'm going to Walnut Trails tomorrow um, to observe classes. So um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and see um, the resources that uh, our schools are using to reach those students and how they are creatively working within the classroom. So I appreciate that opportunity um, they've given me. Uh, we do have one closed session uh, item tonight to discuss collective bargaining, and there will be no action afterwards. If there are no other board topics, I need a motion to go into closed session for purpose of discussing uh, personnel. Sorry, collective bargaining. I'll make the motion we go into closed session. I'll second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Okay, motion carries. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a good night.